five segments we will describe and demonstrate techniques fundamental to biotechnology. We're going to use a hypothetical situation to show how these methods can be used to answer real questions in molecular ecology. Our story involves the weka, an endemic New Zealand bird with four recognised subspecies. In many parts of the country, weka have either disappeared or are threatened, and most now live on predator-free offshore islands. The Department of Conservation wants to move a number of birds to a sanctuary, but before they do that, they've asked us to use molecular techniques to find out a couple of things about the birds. Firstly, they want to know what sex the birds are. As with many birds, it's hard to tell males from females. We will use PCR, followed by restriction digestion and gel electrophoresis, to do this. Secondly, Doc wants to know what subspecies the birds are. We will use PCR, followed by gel electrophoresis and sequencing, to find this out. But before we can do any of this, we need to extract some weka DNA. DNA can be extracted from almost any plant or animal tissue. The best extractions come from fresh material, but DNA has been extracted from tissue as old as 100,000 years. There are many methods for DNA extraction. We will use a commercially available extraction kit, as this is the most straightforward and easy method. We are going to extract DNA from a weaker feather. When the feather is pulled out, a very small piece of tissue comes out in the end of the feather shaft, and this is enough to extract DNA, which will be good for PCR. First, the tissue must be broken down and the cells lysed to release the DNA. This is done by digesting the feather tip with an enzyme. This digestion is carried out in a buffer that will stabilize the DNA and inhibit the enzymes that are released from the cell so that they do not break down the DNA. The digestion is incubated at 55 degrees for a couple of hours. At this temperature, the digestion enzyme is still active, but the enzymes released from the cell are mostly inactive. Once the tissue is completely digested, isopropanol is added, and then the solution is put into a purification column. In the column is a thin layer of silica matrix, like a filter. Because DNA is a charged molecule, it will bind to the silica matrix under certain salt conditions. The isopropanol provides the chemical conditions that ensure the binding of the DNA. The column is centrifuged, which forces the solution through the silica matrix. The DNA will bind to the silica, while the cellular debris will pass through and can then be discarded. Next, the DNA is washed with a buffer containing ethanol and salt. The ethanol washes out the contaminants, while the salt ensures that the DNA is still bound to the matrix. To recover the DNA from the purification column, an elution buffer is added. This buffer provides the chemical conditions which allows the DNA to unbind from the silica matrix. Now when the column is centrifuged, the DNA will be released, or eluted, into a clean tube. Now we have a sample of Weka DNA. You can't see it with the naked eye, so we will have to perform gel electrophoresis on a small sample. Then we will be able to assess the quality and the quantity of the DNA we have extracted. Electrophoresis is a method for separating and visualizing protein, RNA or DNA molecules based upon their size and charge using electrical current and a gel matrix. For this we will need to make a gel medium. In this case we will be adding agarose powder to electrophoresis running buffer to make a final solution of 1% agarose. Different amounts of agarose can be added to produce a more or less dense gel. A more dense gel will be better for separating very small DNA fragments and a less dense gel will be better for separating very large DNA fragments. We need to melt the agarose and let it cool to make the gel. CyberSafe is now added to the molten agarose. CyberSafe is a stain that will attach to the DNA as it runs through the gel and when finished will fluoresce under UV light so you can see the DNA in the gel. Uh, CyberSafe is a, is a safe alternative to the chemical that used to be used called Ethidium Bromide, which is in fact a carcinogen. The gel medium is now poured into a tray to set. And in one end is a cone that will provide the wells into which the uh, DNA samples will be loaded. Once the gel is set, the gel tray is placed in a buffer tank. The buffer tank has electrodes at each end, and the gel tray is positioned so that the wells are at the same end as the negative electrode. We will now add running buffer. This is the same buffer that was used to make the gel. This buffer allows electrical current to run through the system. 
We will now load our DNA samples. First, we need to mix our DNA samples with loading dye, which is a dense blue solution. The density ensures that the DNA sample will fall to the bottom of the well when it is loaded, and the blue dye allows you to track the progress of the electrophoresis. We also load a molecular weight marker, or a ladder, which is a set of commercially available DNA fragments of known sizes that will allow us to estimate the size and concentration of our DNA samples. We now connect the buffer tank to the power supply and allow current to run through the system. A DNA molecule carries a net negative electric charge because of the sugar phosphate backbone. And this means that it will migrate towards the positive electrode and the loading die will behave in the same way. Size separation is achieved through interaction with the DNA and pores in the gel matrix, where small DNA fragments pass easily through these pores and bigger DNA fragments are slowed down. Therefore, small DNA fragments will have moved further than big DNA fragments. In order to see the DNA in the gel, it is placed on a transilluminator, which shines UV light up through the gel and a camera captures the picture above it, which can then be saved or printed. We can now interpret the results of our gel electrophoresis. Across the top of the gel photo you can see the wells. Of course the width of the DNA bands will be the same as the size of the wells that contain them. Down one side you can see the molecular weight marker, or the ladder. We know the size of each of these bands, so given that DNA fragments of the same size will migrate the same distance through the gel, we can now calculate the sizes and the masses of the bands for the DNA samples. Because the gel picture shows our genomic DNA extraction, our band is very big. Now we know our DNA extraction has worked, we can go on and amplify DNA fragments using PCR. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, revolutionized the field of molecular biology and forms the basis for many applications today such as the mapping of the human genome, disease diagnosis, drug discovery, molecular ecology, phylogenetics, forensics, molecular archaeology and ancient DNA. PCR replicates in a test tube the process of DNA replication in cells. It was invented by Carey Mullis, winning him a Nobel Prize. The key to his big breakthrough was the discovery that the DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus, or TAC, is stable at high temperatures. Thermus aquaticus is a bacterium found in the hot pools of Yellowstone National Park. We will use our Weka genomic DNA as a template for two PCRs. The first to determine how genetically different the Weka are from each other, and the second to find out what sex they are. The only difference between these two PCRs is the primers that are used. Our PCR needs a number of different components. Buffer, so the conditions are optimal for TAC enzyme activity, a mix containing all four free nucleotides, A, T, C and G, and water to make it to the right concentration. Primers are short sequences or oligonucleotides that are complementary to the target DNA fragment. We need a forward and a reverse primer for both PCRs. The primers sit at each end of the region we wish to amplify. Finally, we add the enzyme TAC polymerase and the master mix is distributed into all of the PCR tubes. Lastly, the weaker DNA is added to each tube. Here we are testing six birds, so each PCR has seven tubes. The last one is the negative control and contains all of the reagents but no weaker DNA. PCR is such a sensitive technique that it can amplify from just a single DNA molecule, so we must be sure that what we are amplifying is our weaker DNA and not a contaminant. The thermal cycler machine is programmed to cycle through the different temperatures required for PCR. As it cycles, our DNA is amplified. Firstly, our reaction is heated to 95 degrees. This denatures the DNA, causing the hydrogen bonds to break and it becomes single-stranded. The reaction is then cooled enough to allow the complementary primers to anneal to the single-stranded DNA. Depending on factors like primer length and GC content, this temperature is between 50 and 60 degrees. Once the primers have annealed to the template, the temperature is raised to 72 degrees. This is the optimal temperature for the enzyme TAC polymerase, which moves along the single-stranded DNA fragment, allowing complementary nucleotides to bind in a 5' to 3' direction. The result is double-stranded DNA, which can be used as a template for the next cycle. 
PCR proceeds in an exponential fashion and the number of DNA fragments doubles after each cycle. One cycle on average will only take two minutes and is repeated for 25 to 30 cycles. This means in a matter of hours we can amplify millions of copies of DNA. Both our PCRs have worked. In the first lane we have the DNA size marker. In the next six lanes you can see the band from the PCR and lastly the blank negative lane. To find out which sex our birds are, we will need to digest these PCR products with a restriction enzyme. To find out how genetically different they are from each other, these PCR products will need to be sequenced. Restriction digestion is the process by which double-stranded DNA is cut using enzymes called restriction endonucleases. These enzymes recognize and cut at specific sequence motifs. Now this process is an important step in many molecular biology methods. Today we will see how restriction digestion can be used to detect differences between two fragments of DNA. For many species of bird, it is very difficult to tell males from females based on appearance alone. Fortunately, a solution to this problem has been developed using restriction enzyme digestion. Unlike mammals, which have XY sex chromosomes, birds have Z and W. A female bird will have a W and a Z chromosome, and a male bird will have two Z chromosomes. PCR primers have been developed that will amplify matching or homologous regions of both the Z and the W chromosomes. We know that the sequence of these PCR products will be slightly different, where the Z chromosome will have a GGCC sequence motif that is not in the W PCR product. This GGCC sequence motif is the recognition site of the restriction enzyme HAY3. The HAY3 enzyme cuts between the GG and the CC. This means that on a gel we will see a different banding pattern for male and female birds when these PCR products are digested with HAY3. We will now see how this restriction digestion works using PCR products from 6 Weka. A master mix is made of the HAY3 enzyme, buffer and water. The buffer provides optimal chemical conditions for the HAY3 enzyme to work and the water makes the solution up to the correct final concentration. The master mix is then distributed across the six weaker DNA samples. HAY3 works most efficiently at 37 degrees centigrade and will take about 55 minutes to completely digest the PCR products. When this is done, we will perform gel electrophoresis on the digested PCR products and visualize the results. On the left are samples of the uncut PCR products, which are a little under 400 base pairs long. On the right are samples of the same PCR products after digestion with restriction enzyme. In three of these lanes, there are bands that are the same size as the uncut PCR products. These are the W chromosome fragments that HAY3 could not cut. The birds that these samples came from are therefore female. In all of the lanes is a smaller band, a little bigger than 300 base pairs. This is one of the two pieces of the cut Z chromosome DNA fragment. The other piece is very small, around about 60 base pairs, and cannot be seen on this gel. We have now identified that three of these samples came from female birds and three came from male birds. aspects of molecular biology require you to determine the nucleotide order of your DNA product. One way to do this is Sanger sequencing, which was developed by Friedrich Sanger back in 1977. It's still used extensively today. We need to determine the sequence of our Weka PCR product in order to determine which subspecies it is. Importantly, PCR products are mixed with just one PCR primer for sequencing. A sequencing reaction mix contains DNA polymerase, nucleotides and fluorescent nucleotide terminators and it's added to each of the samples. The plate is then placed in a thermal cycler where the fluorescently labelled products are produced. This is a process very like PCR. The double-stranded PCR product is denatured and becomes single-stranded at 95 degrees. After cooling to 50 degrees, the primer anneals to its complementary sequence. When the temperature is raised to 60 degrees, extension occurs. The important aspect of Sanger sequencing is chain termination with dideoxynucleotide triphosphate terminators, or DDNTPs. The DDNTP terminators have the 3' hydroxyl group of carbon-3 of the sugar molecule removed. Inclusion of a DDNTP terminator stops sequence extension. 
These days, DDNTP terminators are fluorescently labelled with a different colour for each of the four nucleotides A, T, C and G. In the past, these used to be radioactively labelled. After 25 cycles, fluorescent products of different lengths have been created. The ratio of nucleotides to DDNTP terminators means fluorescent products for the length of every single base in the sequence will have been created. After the sequencing products have been created, they are put into the capillary machine, which can separate and detect the different length products. The sequencing products will electrophorese through capillaries that are very fine and made of copper. They are coated with glass on the inside and have an internal diameter of just 0.1 millimetres. The capillaries are filled with an acrylamide polymer, which is a solution suitable for separating out DNA products down to just one base in size. The capillary and the electrode are placed in the sample and a voltage is applied from the electrode. Because DNA has a negative charge, it will migrate through the capillary to the positive terminal at the other end. This process is just like gel electrophoresis. Smaller fragments will migrate through the capillary quicker than larger fragments. As they pass through the capillary, a laser excites the dyes, causing them to emit light, which is collected by a camera. Computer software converts the emission patterns into coloured peaks. This is called an electropherogram. It's possible to read sequences of up to a thousand bases with this technology. There are many things you can discover using DNA sequences. For example, we can identify gene coding regions or find mutations that cause disease. In our example, we sequence the mitochondrial control region. This piece of DNA is very variable, which allows us to detect differences between individuals from the same species. We use this to create a phylogenetic tree which shows how related those individuals are to each other. We align or match up our weaker DNA sequences against a database of previously sequenced weaker. Computational analyses are performed which work out which sequences, and hence which birds, are more or less related to each other. This result can be shown in the form of a phylogenetic tree. Here you can see our sequences cluster with others in the lower branches of the tree. These individuals have already been determined to be the North Island subspecies of the weka. Hence the birds we sequence are also part of the North Island subspecies. In conclusion, in our example we have determined that three of the weka are male and three are female. We have also found that all are part of the endangered North Island subspecies. The Department of Conservation can now use this information as part of their weka conservation plan. In molecular biology, cloning involves production of exact copies of a template by using the natural biological systems of cells. For example, many identical copies of a piece of DNA can be made using bacterial cells. Cloning is not only useful for generating many copies of a piece of DNA, it is also a powerful tool for sorting a mix of different DNA fragments. An example of this is shotgun cloning, where many DNA fragments are cloned at the same time. The key to cloning are small circular DNA molecules called plasmids which occur naturally in bacteria. The plasmids that we use for cloning have been altered so they contain additional elements that make cloning easier. Two genes have been added, and because the plasmid has an origin of replication, a bacterium that contains this plasmid will be able to express and use these genes. One gene confers antibiotic resistance, often to ampicillin. The other gene, called LACZ, will allow a bacterium to metabolize a chemical called Xgal. The final element is a site where donor DNA can be inserted. This is a short stretch of sequence that contains several restriction enzyme recognition sites and is called a polylinker. The polylinker is inside the LACZ gene, but by itself will not affect the expression of LACZ. However, if a piece of DNA is inserted into the polylinker, the LACZ gene will be disrupted. Through the interaction of these elements, we are able to select the clones that we want. We refer to these modified plasmids as vectors. They are usually purchased from biotechnology companies that make them. To clone a fragment of DNA, it needs to be inserted into a vector by ligation. Ligation is an enzyme-mediated process where pieces of double-stranded DNA are joined at the phosphate backbone. Prior to ligation, donor DNA and vector DNA are treated so that they have complementary ends. During the ligation, these complementary ends will find each other and the enzyme will join the DNA fragments. Some vector plasmids do not take up the donor DNA and will ligate back together. Now the plasmid vectors need to be put into bacterial cells in a process known as transformation. To transform bacterial cells, they are shocked, causing the cell walls to become more permeable to DNA. This allows the cells to take up foreign DNA like the vector plasmids from their surroundings. Once the cells are transformed, they are spread on agar plates where the individual cells will grow and divide leading to discrete colonies representing millions of copies of one cell. We need to be able to choose colonies that have the donor DNA we are interested in. This is where the genes that were added to the plasmid come into play. 
The agar plates contain small amounts of the antibiotic ampicillin and a modified sugar called Xgel. Some cells will not have taken up the vector during transformation. These will die because they do not naturally have resistance to the ampicillin and the agar. Cells that took up the vector that did not have donor DNA will have an intact LAC-Z gene. This means they will metabolize Xgel and make blue colonies. The remaining cells have vector with the donor DNA inserted. This disrupts the LAC-Z gene so that these cells cannot metabolize Xgel. As a result, they lead to normal white colonies. This method is called blue-white selection. The white colonies will now contain many millions of copies of plasmid vectors containing the donor DNA that we are interested in. Plasmids can now be recovered from individual colonies and used for subsequent applications. For example, we could sequence the donor DNA fragments. So hi, my name is Claudia. I study the ecology and evolution of plants here at the Alvusen Center, and I'm going to talk about microarrays and gene expression studies. Let's see how gene expression studies fit into the big picture of biology. In most organisms, DNA stores information that is transcribed into messenger RNA that is then translated into proteins and these proteins provide structure to the cells and catalyze enzymatic reactions. So to understand how the information that is stored in DNA produces the immense variation that we see in all living organisms or in other words how genotypes give rise to phenotypes. We need to study processes on each level, the level of the genome, the level of the transcriptome, the level of the proteome, and the metabolome. And the exciting thing about studying the transcriptome is that this generates hypotheses about processes on the proteome and the metabolome, but on the same time it allows to make inferences about processes on the genome. One way to study the transcriptome is with microarrays, which are also called DNA chips. These are small slides which carry a big collection of genes of the organism that is being studied. And these gene collections are spotted onto the slide with the help of robots. Let's assume then we'd like to compare gene expression in two samples. We extract messenger RNA from each sample, reverse transcribe this messenger RNA into cDNA, and then label one cDNA with a red and the other one with a green fluorescent dye. Then each red and green labeled cDNA finds its particular target on the microarray and hybridizes to it. The red and green intensities at each particular spot can then be measured and analyzed to determine the amount of differential gene expression between both samples. So we can use microarrays to study ecological interactions between species. For example, we investigated if two plants from the nitrate family a tobacco plant and a black nitrate plant would actually switch on and off different sets of genes when they're being eaten by the same type of caterpillar, a tomato hornworm. For this type of study, we used a microarray with a gene collection from potato because potato is also a plant from the nitrate family and we actually called this a potato chip. So the results of this potato chip study were illustrated with a Venn diagram. And in the middle of the Venn diagram, you can see the numbers of commonly up and down regulated genes in both plant species. Whereas to the left and to the right of the diagram, you see the unique responses of each species. Well, interestingly, the unique responses involve many more genes than the shared response. So from this study, we learned that there's no such thing as a blueprint for defense responses in plants. And also, that a plant's capacity to respond to herbivory is much more likely to depend on its experiences with different herbivores over evolutionary time. At the Al Wilson Center, we are interested in the evolution of a group of eight species of New Zealand alpine cress. Their scientific name is Pachycladon. And these eight species of Pachycladon evolved from a common ancestor during the last million years in the southern Alps of New Zealand and occur nowhere else in the world. And with the help of microarrays, we hope to predict the selection pressures that drove speciation in Pachycladon and at the same time hope to identify the genes that were under natural selection during the evolution of these eight species. So to keep it simple, we set out to compare gene expression in two species, Pachycladon anisei and Pachycladon fastigiata. So we went to the Southern Alps to collect leaves of three populations of each species and actually this has been quite a challenging expedition where we had to cope with flat tires and to carry liquid nitrogen around us to shock freeze the leaves. Later in the lab we extracted messenger RNA that we used in our microarray study. So we can graphically illustrate the results of our microarray study with a volcano plot. And in this volcano plot 
The purple dots represent those 310 genes that are upregulated in Pachycladium fastigiata, and the red dots represent those 324 genes that are upregulated in Pachycladium initii. All the black dots in the volcano plot represent those genes that are not differentially expressed between both species. So a closer look at all the purple and the red dots in the volcano plot suggested that Pachycladium initii and Pachycladium fastigiata would produce different types of mustard oils. And mustard oils are secondary plant compounds that some plants produce to defend themselves against herbivores. So inspired by our microarray study, we measured mustard oil contents in both plant species and indeed we found that they differ in their mustard oil profiles. So from this study we concluded that herbivores have played their part in the evolution of these two species and our next microarray studies will include more pegicladon species to further investigate this hypothesis. tissue culture or micropropagation, the production of a plantlet or a clone, a genetically identical copy of its parent plant via a process called the aseptic technique. So aseptic technique means that everything is kept as sterile as possible, that it's been either treated with bleach or with alcohol of some description and then heat or pressure treated. We need to sterilize ourselves before we go into the flow hood. So I'm taking some 70% ethanol and I'm going to spray it onto my hands so that any surface contaminants won't be transferred to the plantlets or inside this here, which is a laminar flow hood. It's an airflow which prevents contaminants from traveling into the hood. So we could choose any tissue type of a plant. We could choose shoots or roots, meristematic regions, or we could choose vegetative material, like this leaf here. The first thing that we need to do is sterilize our leaf, or surface sterilize our leaf, to remove any microorganisms which might be actually on the leaf itself. The reason that we need to do this is because those microorganisms are gonna love what we put the leaf disc on because it's gonna have lots of sugar in it. So we take our forceps, and we dip them in our 70% ethanol, being very careful because it's highly flammable and we turn to a nice blue hot flame which you can't see and we flame them up turn it back to safety flame now we go back to our leaf we place it in a 10% bleach solution just like you'd have bleach at home we agitate that up and down. I'm going to do a quick run because we don't have that much time, but you want two to three minutes. And then through a series of sterile water washes to remove any of the excess bleach that we might have left on that leaf. Once we get to the last sterile wash, we're almost ready for the next stage of micropropagation, which is to take our explant and to put it onto a solid media. Now this solid media contains all the nutrients and goodness that this explant will need to produce its roots and its shoots and make it look more like a little plant. So here I have a, a Petri dish which has got our solid media on it. Now this solid media contains its carbohydrate source, which is sucrose or sugar, and various hormones, specifically auxin, and cytokinin involved in root formation and shoot formation, respectively. So we need to take a nice square, or you might hear it referred to as a leaf disc. It doesn't have to be a particularly neat square. We leave it out of the sterile water and we place it firmly but gently onto the solid media pushing it down so we have a good contact, so all of that tissue will be in contact with the hormones and the nutrients. Now we can seal up the plate, we use some parafilm to maintain a nice sterile environment. It's just a very thin plastic which we use to seal up all the edges. And that's ready to go into our incubator for a nice long day, a full summer's day of 16 hours, daylight, eight hours night. Now I mentioned about the hormones that go into the solid media. So we have the two, the auxins and the cytokinins. Now, if we had the same amount of auxins and cytokinins, we would generate callus. Now, this is what callus looks like. It's a bit messy, it doesn't look green like a plant. It's a mass of undifferentiated cells. Now we could 
take this callus and we could put it onto a new plate which may contain high levels of auxin and low levels of cytokinin. That would allow it to develop roots. Those hormones would say generate roots and it would generate roots. We could then transfer that onto a plate with high cytokinins and low auxins and that would suggest to make shoots. So we can control the development of that plant depending on the hormones that we choose in our solid media. Now we're going to take this plant, this little X plant, which is on its nutrient mix with hormones, and we're going to place it into our incubator. After several transfers, we've gone from what we began with, this X plant, to this little plantlet, which as you can see has a very, very good root architecture now and well-developed leaves. So that's the end of micropropagation as this plant is now ready to go out into the soil.